Uh, yes, hello, good morning, and thank you very much for the great invitation. I'm very honored uh, to be the keynote speaker for this important event. Uh, as, uh, as I was introduced, I am the founder and head of the Development Impact Evaluation Department at the World Bank. In 2005, when we started this work at the World Bank, the idea that research could be brought uh, to the service of policies in developing countries and support a process of, of um, uh, intensive use of data and evidence in those policies was fairly novel and, and not quite accepted. Today, after uh, about 15 years of investment in this area and uh, building partnerships across the world around 200 partner organizations and innumerable um, government agencies, we have been building and learning in, the process, in this process um, and kind of documenting the potential that research has for supporting a process of in improving development practice and also increasing the returns, substantially increasing the returns to development finance. And so I'm here really um, opening this uh, conference with a very positive message. Uh, of course, we are in a period of crisis, but what we have found that through the use of data and evidence and through the investments that we have made over time in different settings, the type of response that we can provide today to the crisis is uh, uh, much greater uh, because of uh, these uh, efforts and uh, collaborations with, uh, with government partners on the ground. So the, the idea really for science to be put to action is one that I will be discussing today. And I will be providing a set of examples uh, throughout our program and throughout um, our results as, as validated by our clients on the ground, which we um, survey regularly to understand how the science, how the data and evidence that we generate with them turns into uh, into action and how that action then affects the results on the ground. Um, we have grown quite a bit and I'm going to skip through, um, you know, the geographical distribution uh, of, our, of our work around uh, 62 countries around the world. And just to tell you that we work all across um, the uh, sectors in which the World Bank is present. And we have uh, a large focus on a gender agenda, about 23% of, uh, of our work uh, include the gender specific interventions and a third uh, are in fragile context. Uh, currently, uh, our, you know, the last six years, we have leveraged from donors and partners about $200 million in financing that has been uh, helping to shape the delivery of $20 billion in development finance. Um, so a very small proportion of development finance devoted to data and evidence. Um, I hope I will convince you and show you how that uh, little investment can actually be quite transformative of the development process. So in this process, in this, uh, in this period, uh, we have become a global leader in what I would call adaptive development research um, in the sense that our research collaborates with programs on the ground, policies and programs on the ground to provide, uh, you know, in a, a constant um, feedback into policy processes uh, by using uh, data, data analytics and experiments to guide the policy process along and, and secure the, the um, uh, collaborations and increasing the capacities of our clients to understand what the data says and what the evidence is, uh, and how the evidence can be operationalized to then improve policies and programs on the ground. So we started off uh, early in our history with a focus on randomized controlled trials uh, as a way of um, uh, rigorously in fair causality of the policy interventions that were being put on the ground on the outcomes of interest. But as part of these collaborations uh, across the world grew, uh, so has 
um, so have our um, the menu of services that we have been providing. And of course, also with technolo technological changes in the world, uh, our work has evolved quite a bit in the last 15 years. Uh, but I just want to give you an, a, a, a kind of um, a summary of the type of engagements we uh, we um, have with our client governments. These include kind of innovating in the measurements and the building their data capabilities to understand what to understand the problems that we are trying to solve. So we don't just build the data for the purpose of data, but we're trying we try to build the data sets that then can be used analytically to understand better the problem, help us uh, target and prioritize policy action. And in um, some cases also, um, as you will hear later in, uh, in the day, uh, will help us uh, identify efficiencies and ways of doing things um, uh, that um, the government can take advantage of to improve uh, the efficiency of their public services as well as reducing their cost. Um, and of course, uh, on, on, uh, build, we build these data capabilities around policy questions of interest that are always agreed with governments and prioritized with governments. Um, and these include kind of understanding the way in which programs and policies can be improved through the use of randomized controlled trials, uh, as well as evaluating the impact of the overall interventions to document their success and justify scale up as, as uh, the case might be. So in a nutshell, um, the DIME research model is really based on a close collaboration uh, between the research, the operations, and the government clients. And the idea there is to both build capacities of those clients to use data and evidence in a more uh, articulated fashion, as well as co-generate with them new data and evidence that can help optimize policy and project designs. So quickly, the kind of the results that we can um, we have recorded on our program include both efficiency gains and effectiveness gain. And the fact that the efficiency gains are, are um, obtained without impinging on our ability to increase the effectiveness of the operations. So we, we observe a 37% increase in, uh, in the speed of disbursement of bank operations. Um, and we um, also kind of um, draw a contract uh, with them in a sense of spending part of the resources, but spending it in the direction of substantially increasing the effectiveness of those, uh, those operations. The drivers, again, are the strength of the engagement with our clients, with the idea of really focusing on the most important problems that they face, as well as securing adoption once results are available and focused a lot on the quality of research, both by establishing high scientific standards and also um, kind of securing through that process very precise answers that would allow us to uh, suggest uh, a direction or a change in policy that would be beneficial to um, the um, uh, policy uh, beneficiaries. So I would like to kind of um, organize some of the examples that I'm going to talk to you about along three areas um, to kind of understand the type of effects that we can hope from uh, this, this type of research. The first is kind of really transforming the data environments for delivering projects and, and policies. The second is focusing on, on optimizing project designs. And the third is designing new policy framework, frameworks. And the way we think of um, um, our role is not to evaluate necessarily what a project or a policy delivers, uh, but really focus on uh, a series of underlying questions that then will help that program or policy deliver on its promises. And so I, I, I call these fixed common project pathologies because in our experience, we find that a lot of development projects suffer from the same um, constraints and barriers to success, uh, which are sometimes uh, questions that seem of a lower order, but 
um, that end up being very significant in terms of the ability of policies to deliver. So to give you some examples, we ask questions such as how to increase participation or adoption um, into projects, for example, for agricultural technology or managerial practices in private sector or even uh, in government, or how to target different populations with the right instrument. Um, for example, we have work on cash for work programs that I'll discuss a little later where, you know, a different, different populations benefit differentially uh, from uh, different policy instruments and we should kind of learn how to target different policy instruments to different populations or how to use measurement uh, in the process of providing information back to users or providers of services to help them improve um, what they do. Uh, important examples come from water management systems or improving patient safety um, that I'll discuss a little later. Um, another issue that we target is how to optimize designs of contracts and incentives, for example, the transition from construction, road construction com uh, contracts to contracts that include both road construction and road maintenance that inherently change the incentives for the construction companies to deliver quality on the construction or how to price services to increase access. Here we have huge issues of balancing financial sustainability of uh, public utilities and public operators uh, versus ensuring wide access to public services to population to targeted populations. And finally, uh, we often include uh, questions regarding social norms and how to change the social norms to make them more consistent with the development outcomes we are seeking. Uh, for example, using mass media uh, to uh, inform and incentivize the um, better understanding of, uh, of a disease transmission for populations to be able to protect themselves or uh, measures to reduce violence against women or um, adolescent pregnancies. So I'm going to um, give you some examples in the three areas that I, I laid out. The first being transforming data and research environment. And this example comes from Rwanda where we have been working since uh, 2012, uh, initially on an agricultural uh, technology adoption program, but then in an increasing number of policy questions at the national level, including a large program of rural infrastructure investments around the country. And as part of that effort, we started building uh, a national, a, a national um, data set that integrates different type of information and, and significantly expands our ability to understand um, um, the economy of, uh, of Rwanda. This include administrative data, for example, from, uh, from land registries or investment plans, it includes census and survey data, both from the private sector and households. It includes remote sensing data, for example, GPS from commercial vehicles. And uh, as part of, of this work, we also invest in collecting primary data in about 200 agricultural markets on more than 60 products to understand the, the segmentations of the markets and its implication for road for um, food security in, in the country. And, you know, if I were to ask you today what progress suffered the highest drop in price since the crisis started, you know, we would be kind of hard pressed to guess um, the, the change in prices and which sectors of the economy have suffered most. But because of the type of data that we have been constructing, uh, the team has been able to provide the Rwandan government with real-time information on uh, changes in prices by combining um, these fund surveys in rural markets together with um, tax administration data on weekly retail price and transactions and um, a phone service of lead farmers. So for example, we, you can see in this chart that different, different type of products in the agricultural economy have been affected quite differentially by the crisis. If we compare the price change between uh, last year and this year, um, 
on, uh, on these products. And if we look at the impact of the lockdown on sales, we can also kind of understand the magnitude of the suffering that um, the crisis um, is uh, contributing to um, on the rural economy. Now, this type of information, of course, can be used to, um, to respond to the crisis with differential support to different sectors or uh, developing strategies for, um, for addressing um, kind of social protection strategies for addressing issues of, uh, of food security or other. Similarly, um, you know, if I were to ask you a kind of an open question on road safety, uh, on, you know, what portion of the of the city network road network uh, host 50% of crashes, you could potentially guess some uh, from my list, uh, whether the proportion is uh, one, two, five or 10 or 25%. Uh, but still, uh, given the amount of or the lack of data um, available on road crashes in most African metropolises, we would be hard pressed to uh, prioritize uh, road safety policies and investments to meet the sustainable development goal number three, which is to reduce mortality on the roads by 50%. Our work in, uh, in Nairobi is an example of how we could start from a, from a situation in which no data is available for analysis to a situ situation in which uh, we transform this setting in a rich uh, in a rich data setting uh, where we both digitized uh, police records from all the police stations in the city. Uh, we, you, we develop new algorithms to geolocate uh, social media reports on, uh, on the incidence of crashes. We merge the data with private data from Uber and Waze and weather and maps. Uh, to supplement the information with weather conditions, traffic and speed conditions, as well as conduct a kind of primary data collection on uh, hotspots where uh, accidents um, are recorded in uh, Nairobi to understand the infrastructure issues as well as the uh, road users behaviors issues uh, with more than 70 different indicators on these locations that then can inform and shape uh, the policy response. So the, 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 I would say the amazing, one of the amazing results of doing that kind of analysis is that when, we've, when government faced the problem of resolving uh, road safety on 4,500 kilometer of roads, um, the, the ability of that government to respond effectively is, uh, is small. But when we learn that about 45 kilometers out of the 4,500 are responsible for 50% of deaths, uh, the problem of road safety becomes immediately more manageable. And so really the power of, um, of these data systems is not just for the study and evaluation of uh, policies, but really they become part and parcel of the planning process and prioritization of policy processes. And to, to achieve that, I want to say that when we started this work, uh, we realized that the tools to uh, analyze data, social media data were just not available or were not uh, sufficiently efficient for us to use. And so there was quite a bit also of an investment in the data science of, um, of geolocating uh, and timestamping tweets and putting them on a map in real time. Um, now, I want to move now to this idea um, that in addition of building data, uh, we focus on specific questions that then can help uh, our policies and programs succeed. And so the first uh, common area of that we tackle is the area of take up or, population or participation. As we all know, when we have new programs, we expect a, you know, a long line of people wanting to participate in these programs, but often, the result is more like a stadium during COVID um, where we have very low participation and low take up and that will affect the success of our program very significantly. Now, 
Uh, it will also affect the success of the impact evaluation that you would want to run as, you know, as a real kind of uh, easy rule of thumb, if only one half of the people that you were targeting participate, uh, you may need four times the sample and kind of really increase the cost of the impact evaluation if you are able to do it at all. Um, so take up is something that we experiment quite a bit in the early stages of a project development. In this case, it's a pro project in Ghana on tree planting, providing little uh, uh, seedlings to farmers to plant trees. So on the side, we experimented with a randomized control trial on, the, on providing incentives to farmers to plant trees. And what we found is that the monetary incentives triplicate the number of farmers willing to participate in this program. Now, participation is not the only thing we should maximize things on. So we, we went ahead and kind of start thinking about what the optimal incentives, the optimal pricing of that incentive would be. Uh, and we used um, uh, some uh, very, you know, an approach with a lot of ingenuity to understand uh, reservation wages among our farmers and we um, repriced the incentives to about half as much and we're able to use the savings, uh, the budgetary savings to increase the size of this program and increase the coverage of community of this program, increasing the effectiveness of the overall program by 68%. Now, as you can see, triplicating in 68%. I mean, these are very, very large numbers and the, uh, the cost of, of the financing of the research underlying these large increases in effectiveness are really, really tiny um, in, in relative terms. Now, the issue of pricing, we can tackle in, in environments where there is a lot of data. For example, in Bogota with the Transmillennium system, we use the uh, smart card data. Um, my dog is running. Um, a smart, smart card data to understand uh, the impact of a change in fair policies that um, differentially affected different populations in the city, um, we can use that information to um, come up with a quite detailed analysis of uh, the impacts on mobility and links to market of populations from different so socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, and also look at the elasticity of um, of um, demand relative to the fair policies. In this case, um, even though the fares were increased, um, total revenues fell, um, suggesting that you know, the trade-off between financial sustainability and accessibility to, to transport um, may need to be uh, revised. And so we are working with the, with the uh, Transmillennium system to provide a lot of feedback onto the fair policy and subsidization policy to maximize welfare in the city. Um, another area of uh, design optimization is targeting. Target retar and specifically retargeting programs um, that have been um, targeted perhaps on the mo most deserving populations without necessarily thinking through uh, which population, deserving population will be most likely to benefit from a specific policy instrument. So kind of matching policy instruments to different populations to maximize the effectiveness of our policies. It is not only uh, specific, to a specific to a program, but also kind of a, um, can inform portfolio choices uh, on our policy instruments. And in the case of, um, uh, in the case, for example, of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, we found that a cash for work program, a social protection program targeted to very vulnerable populations, uh, was, had uh, quite differential impacts depending on the uh, type of population in, uh, in this program. And specifically, we found that women could benefit um, 63 percentage points more than um, um, sorry, $63 
instead of $35 on, on average. And that by retargeting this government program to include a much larger quota for women, we could increase the program effectiveness by a, a large 70%. Again, uh, as you can see, the, the numbers are uh, quite, the magnitude of these numbers are, are consistently large, in part because the questions that we ask uh, together with our clients are really focused on where we see the greatest potential for improvement. On, uh, on the side of delivery mechanisms, um, this is, I find uh, throughout my experience in development, the, there are typologies of development projects, and these typologies are replicated in multiple settings and in different environments. And these delivery mechanisms and replications might not actually be optimal. And so, for example, in agriculture adoption, it is very common to use a demonstration plot to incentivize other farmers to adopt new technologies. Now, in the case of Bangladesh, we proposed kind of democratizing the process of demonstration and actually have farmers self-demonstrate uh, with smaller amounts, with tiny amounts of uh, fertilizer and seeds. Um, and the results are quite striking. Uh, we find that the, the greater the number of, of farmers self-demonstrating, the larger the impacts on, uh, on adoption of new technologies and the areas are cultivated with new technologies. So this is, uh, again, something that, some, that may look quite small from a, from a testing point of view, but it has ra radically changes the adoption patterns of these farmers. Now, coming to our third area, uh, which relates to policy frameworks, I like to discuss two cases. One is building from really from scratch an accountability system for patient safety. Uh, this is a very topical issue. Um, the, the idea here is that the levels of patient safety, specifically in the type of environments in which we are working, are very, very low. And so when people join um, go to facilities um, because they're sick, they may end up being uh, infected with other things. And during, um, during the COVID crisis, of course, um, this has been a, a, an issue of great concern as COVID patients enter the premises and many more people uh, end up um, being infected. Now, the question is, can a new inspection system improve patient safety? And what we um, kind of, the the, um, the, the um, components of, uh, of a new inspection system include three parts. The rules, the regulation, um, some kind of monitoring system to track whether or not the regulation is uh, being upheld, and, and then the use of the monitoring system to identify um, the need for enforcement. And I added here institutional capacity because in the case at hand, at hand and in most cases, we need to invest a lot in the institutional capacity for a new inspection system or for a new accountability system to be put in place. Now, in the um, randomized controlled trial that we ran on uh, the impact of a patient safety system, this was five years after having developed the system in the first place, um, we find that there the an accountability system um, was actually able to elicit wide response from the facilities without the need to transfer uh, financial resources. What the system did was to collect standardized data on patient safety and then uh, help the facilities understand what the data uh, was communicating to them and the need to invest in a number of issues that then would improve the level of safety in their facilities. And so about 95% of the facilities improved their, their patient safety score um, with an a, a overall impact of an increase in 50% in that measure pa patient safety um, across the system. Another case where I um, I think another interesting case 
uh, where we have uh, supported the development of policy frameworks was in the design of a justice regulation. Now, uh, as you will hear later from Daniel uh, Chen, um, we have a large program on justice uh, that uses intensively um, artificial intelligence to understand the working of justice. Uh, but this was a very early experience, uh, was our first um, interaction with the justice sector uh, in the courts of, of Dakar in Senegal, where we were planning an experiment, uh, kind of making information salient to judges. Um, and as part of that, we started investing in digitizing all the case management information from the um, from um, the basement of the Dakar court. We literally digitized um, stacks and stacks of papers and created a data set to understand uh, the, the issues and the working of the justice system, of the commercial justice system in Senegal. And as part of the analysis, we provided a lot of feedback to the head of the courts in the, the constraints for increasing the speed of the resolution of these cases. And this information was used to inform the design of a regulatory framework um, that then we evaluated using the same data uh, a, a, a regulatory reform that was extremely effective in reducing the pre-trial period by one third. Uh, later, we have used this information and connected to tax data to understand the impact on the private sector. This work has been done in more than one country. And uh, I, I think we can say at least reasonably that there is uh, an effect of, uh, of the efficiency of the justice system on the private sector, which cannot be ignored. So I'm, I'm going to um, uh, kind of conclude by saying that as part of, well, first that I hope I convinced you that the research can be an, an unusually um, productive resource to develop and practice to really improve the state of, of, um, of uh, development finance. But also want to say that as part of this process and as part of developing uh, a lot of learning and, and different capacities to do uh, research in the field um, across 60 and more countries. Um, we also developed uh, capabilities that we have shared with the rest of the research community and also with, uh, with our clients. And those include both training capabilities, they include uh, uh, public goods, uh, for um, for uh, research, examples of that are the Dime Wiki, the R Econ Visual Library, the Stata Visual Library. We have an impact evaluation toolkit, an impact evaluation field kit. Uh, and in general, we are always open to sharing all the resources that we have um, to benefit the rest of the research community, uh, especially in uh, developing countries where the capacities are more limited and uh, local researchers uh, really need more support um, in, uh, in this direction. I also, we have invested um, uh, kind of in a radical approach to increase the reproducibility of our work and have introduced um, procedures uh, throughout our research that secures a high reproducibility of our work. Uh, those those uh, processes and procedures are also something um, that we um, um, are willing to share with others who are interested in improving, other organizations that are interested in improving uh, the transparency and reproducibility of their research. So I'm going to conclude by saying, by kind of focusing on maybe two or three takeaways. Uh, the first uh, is the good news um, that I announced in the beginning of my talk, which is that investing in data, data analytics and impact evaluation has really high value added. It not only um, can help improve the efficiency of uh, development policy, but also kind of secure large improvements in effectiveness at the relatively uh, tiny uh, cost. 
in um, in in this process, of course, we we uh, hope to generate a large amount of scientific knowledge and public resource tools for improve for improving development economics more more generally. Um, and while I've talked about DIME and uh, the experiences that we have had with our research projects, I, I wanna say that this would not have been possible without the large number of partnerships that we have been able to count on throughout our, uh, our work. Um, more than 200 organizations, many research organizations, and also many partners and donors that have helped us really push the, that work this work forward. And uh, we really hope uh, that many more Korean organizations uh, will be uh, interested and become active partners to our programs. We really appreciate the uh, KDI School uh, initiative on, on this partnership. Um, and we are really, really uh, looking forward to uh, working more closely with you. So I want to thank you, the organizers, and uh, Dean Yu uh, for this kind of invitation. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and ask whether uh, we have time for a little Q&A, if there is anyone who's interested in um, uh, making a comment or a question. <laughs> 